It is Wednesday afternoon, July 12th. If you're following us in video afterward, we did miss July 5th, so go back to the end of June and then come up to July 12th to have the continuity. I promised the last time I taught that we were going into Chapter 24, and we did manage to get into the very beginning, the background, and so rather than take... Is it the 12th or the 11th? Today's the 12th. Yep. Yes, Wednesday the 12th. You lost a day, sorry. <laughs> I missed a day. <laughs> you missed a day. Um, for whatever reason, I always hear 7-Eleven halfway to heaven. <laughs> and we're on the 12th. <laughs> um, in chapter 24, where we're going to pick up, Abraham feels like he's aging. He's like any good father. He wants to know his son is set up and things are good for him. He wants things to go on well for him. He wants him to have the blessings of the Lord. So he's going to want to set things into motion for his son Yitzhak, Isaac. But we saw in our background in that class that I taught prior, and so go to it and get the, the detail, because I, if I start on it, I'll take the whole class on it again. <laughs> I don't want to do that for those who are hurt. But this chapter, we call it typology, and that's when we have a picture, something that's actually happening, but it's a, bit, a, a foreshadowing of something that's coming, a bigger picture that we can see in it. Easily, I brought the, the picture of the sacrificial lamb. When we say that the, the Lord Yeshua Jesus is the Lamb of God, we're not saying he's four-legged, woolly, you know, but it's a picture. In typology, in Genesis 24, we have a great picture of God calling out a bride for his son. And that bride that he's calling out is commonly called the church. I will call it the called out assembly usually because I don't want people to get hung up on thinking about a building or a denomination or anything else. That's not what it is. If you have faith in Yeshua Jesus as your Savior, then you have a bridegroom. We, you are his bride. Sorry, men, it goes for you too. You're brides in this case because Yeshua is in the role of the bridegroom. God the Father, Yehovah the Father, we see our, our triune God. Yehovah the Father chooses out for his son a bride. And that's what we're going to see in this, which happens to be the longest chapter in the book of Genesis. There's 67 verses, but Actually, depending on how we do, we might go through all 67 today because story goes quickly in places. So let's start in and see where we go. We have Abraham, our, our main, I don't want to call him a character, but that's what you usually call him when you're reading a book, our main person who has been walking a walk of faith with this God. We've seen him in his ups, we've seen him in his downs, lets us know that he was as human as we are. <laughs> Hello. And sadly, we are going to lose him in a short time. I, I feel like I'm losing a friend because studying him and walking with him through his shoes, you, you come to a closeness. But even though he thinks it's coming fast, he's going to live another 35 years. So we won't lose him quite yet. But if we start out with it saying that he is old, well, I think we could say that when Yitzhak was born because he was 100 when Yitzhak was born. So he's even older now. He's almost 140, a um, little, little short of that. But anyway, he's advanced in age, as the scripture says. Well stricken if you have the old King James. Hebrews says he entered into days. That just means he has lots of days. I should have Googled and asked how many days are in 140 years. <laughs> and I can tell you how many days he'd lived on this earth, and it'd be a phenomenal number. But uh, we're going to see that he was 140 when Yitzhak, at 40, gets married. So any of you who are in a hurry to see your kids married, I think Avraham's got you beat. 51,100 days. 51,100 days that Avraham has walked on this earth by the time he sees his son married. Okay, that's a long time. Um, how do we get this? Just to show you I'm not making things up, switch to chapter 25 real quick, and then you can come right back to chapter 20. Verse, uh, I'm sorry, back to chapter 24. Verse 20 of chapter 25, And Isaac, Yitzhak, was 40 years old, when he took Rivka, Rebecca, the daughter of Bethuel, the Araman of Padan Aram, the sister of Levon, the Araman, to be his wife. Now I'll explain all that when we're in chapter 25, but right now you just see it tells us specifically he was 40 years old 
when he took Rivka, Rebecca, for his wife. So we're going to go back and we're going to see how that happened because she's not in the picture yet. We haven't heard anything about her. Oh, and by the way, in chapter 25, verse 7, if you're still there or you can just listen, this is when we'll say shalom. We'll say lehetrot to Abraham. Lehetrot means I'll be seeing you again. Not that we've seen him yet, but we'll see him for real with, with more than spiritual eyes when we, too, are home with the Lord. Verse 7, chapter 25, these are all the years of Abraham's life that he lived, 175 years. Now, this is easy math, but I just want to make sure you're thinking. If Abraham dies at 175, how old is Yitzhak, Isaac, when he dies, when, when Abraham dies? 135. No, 40-something. Oh, how old is he? He's a hand, Abraham, his father, is 175 <coughs> when Isaac dies. Shortcut, quick way to think. Very good. Dora just got 75. If he was 100 when Isaac was born, then it's going to be 175. He's, when he dies, then Isaac is 75. Okay, Just to make them more real, more people to you and, and understanding. So if he gets married at 40, Abraham's going to see him in his married life for 35 years. But at this point, I think Abraham is thinking, dear God, I could die almost any time. I want to see my son married. I want to know he's got... Because I think a part of what was behind the scene here right now, and I'll show you when we get to the end of the lesson why I say that, but I think Yitzhak was really missing his ima, his mom. And there's not a thing wrong with that. That doesn't make him a mama's boy. That makes him have a heart that's tender and loving for his mother. You know, I think that Abraham and Sarah and Yitzhak were very close. And now one of them is missing. And I think that Yitzhak was still in a state of, of some mourning, M-O-U-R-N, mourning for his mother. And I think Avraham wanting to comfort his son, I think he, he thought he needs a wife. You know, he needs that tender love on that side that comes from a woman. So just to give you behind the scenes, just to make them real people to you, because that's what we're studying. We're not reading a made-up story. We're studying people who actually lived and walked and talked with our God and what we can learn from them in our lives today. So Abraham has a purpose and he feels a responsibility. And so going back to chapter 24 and looking at verse 2, I think I skipped the end of one, I'm sorry. The Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. And here again, I think Abraham was feeling that. He had had a wife. He had a, his son of promise for, for almost 40 years now. We know he had flocks and herds and servants, and we know he had water rights to the wells. You know, we, we see him blessed in every way. Scripture just being very honest. So, verse 2, Abraham said to his servant. Now, um, it clarifies which servant because he had many servants. It's the oldest of his household who was in charge of all that he owned. So this is like head of the servants. This is the top dog right under Abraham. It would be Abraham's right-hand man. The rest would be under this servant's control. This servant would be the one saying, you go do this, you go do that, you know, and following through. This is one that I think probably has earned that position through the years. He's shown himself to be trustworthy, helpful, uh, you know, has a good insight into things. Probably, we're talking about Eliezer at Damascus. If you go back with me to chapter 15, you will see why I say that it's probably this one. Now, he's never named in chapter 24, but, sorry, the tablet does not want to do what I want it to do. Chapter 15 of Genesis, long enough ago, I know we don't remember, but verse 2 Abraham's talking to God because God has told him he's going to prosper and he knows he's going to have uh, a, a son. But in verse 1, he's being told that great's going to be his reward. And Abraham Abram at this time says, Lord, God, Adonai, God, what will you give me since I am childless? The heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Well, that means that Abraham was saying, if I die without giving, having a blood son, then usually the, um, the heir would be the servant 
of that household. He would be the one that would come into the wealth that, that his master had had. It would be the head servant that would get that because the head servant would become like, it, like a son to the master of the home. So Eliezer probably was like a son to Abraham until Yitzhak did come along and then you know he was uh, still appreciated, he was still um, the esteemed head servant, but Isaac now will be the one who will receive everything that belongs to Abraham when Abraham passes away. It would not go now to Eliezer. But this oldest of his household in charge of all that he owned is already a sneak picture for us that we're seeing something bigger. Because remember we know, we, we get the advantage of looking back. So we know that we're going to get a picture of a father calling out a, a bride for his son. And we know that when we look at this, we're going to see that this unnamed servant, this unnamed to us, is a type of the Ruch HaKodesh, of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not come in his own name. He comes to do the work of the Father and the Son. Let me take you to give you the example of Yochanan, John 16. Chapter uh, 16 of the book of Yochanan, John, in our New Covenant, our Brit Chadashah. And we're going to look at verses 13 and 14. Yeshua is foretelling about his death and, and uh, resurrection that's coming. But uh, verse 12, as you're getting the 13 and 14, says, I have many more things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. Yeshua wanted to tell his Talmudim, his disciples, those following him, and he had so much to tell them, so much to teach them. He's having to pack it into three and a half years because that's about the time of ministry he had before uh, he goes to the cross. So verse 13, he says, But... When he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. So the Holy Spirit is going to come, not speak to you about himself, but he's going to speak to you about whatever he's hearing and being told, whatever the Father's telling him to say, and he's going to represent the Father, and we know he's also going to remind them of everything Yeshua Jesus taught them because we also get told that in another place. But verse 14 does say, He will glorify me, for he will take a mine and will disclose it to you. So the Holy Spirit is working on behalf of the Father and the Son, and he's not coming in his own name. We're going to see the servant does not go in his own name. He goes in the name of Abraham, the Father, to get the bride for the Son. Uh, look at verse Chapter 14 and verse 26, that may be the other that I was just referring to. It might be the verse I wanted also. Chapter 14 of Yochanan, of John. John 14, 26, sorry, because you were right there. Yeah, and here is the other part that I wanted. But the counselor, the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, Yeshua Jesus speaking, he will teach you everything. That is, he'll remind you of everything I've said to you. So there's where we see he's going to remind the Talmudim what Yeshua Jesus has been teaching them, give them the fuller understanding of it, and we also see that he is speaking for the Father who has sent him. So again, the Holy Spirit working for both other members of the triunity of God. Um, almost, you can see this in the example of the Emmaus Road. Yeshua was the one speaking then. He, he taught to them, he was teaching them, he was giving them all the prophetic scriptures that he had fulfilled, their eyes were suddenly open and they realized when Yeshua disappeared, it was the Lord who was walking with them. He goes back, they go back, they tell the, the other brethren, these are the ones who in a very short time experienced uh, Shavuot, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh, in the upper room and they were able to be literally, I'll put it, well not literally, but figuratively lit on fire to take the gospel out to the others because of the work of the Holy Spirit on them. Now back to Genesis 24, if Eliezer is the servant, he has been with Abraham since before chapter 15, because in chapter 15 he's the, the tried and true servant and in that high position. Chapter 15 was at least 55 to 60 years ago, so Eliezer's no spring chicken either. 
you know, if he was old enough to be in a head servant position, he wasn't 10 or 15, you know, he had to have had a few years in there, plus 55 to 60 years. So we're, we're talking, you know, he's getting up there also. For whatever reason, though, Abraham feels like that he is up to it and he's the one that should go. So he tells the oldest of his household, who is in charge of all that he owned, please place your hand under my thigh. Now to us today, we go, what? <laughs> but back in that time, that was a solemn way of signifying an oath. And this oath, if it was violated, the children of the one that, that the oath was violated would come after the, the side that violated. It was that strong of an oath that it didn't stop with the person's death. It would even be carried on down the line. That it was not something done lightly. It was not, oh, I'll just say whatever and shake their hands. No, this was this was their word and their word was to be followed through it would be considered an act of disloyalty by the uh, of the children if they did not step up for their father in in the sense of it and by the way in the Hebrew the word can be also translated side or shaft so we picture the thigh it could be on the side of the leg however it was whoever wants to read into this something not nice they're not nice that's not what the scripture's teaching us, okay? Do you want to close the windows because our air came on? You know what I think too? Is Go ahead, talk loud. When you sit next to somebody, sometimes you'll put your hand like that. Okay. Not even going under the thigh, but like... Like touching right yeah, next to it. Yeah, it's about the same thing. Yeah, and it's, it's a reaching out in a psalm oath. He's, he's asking this servant to pledge himself to what he's going to ask him to do. And if the servant meets him, you know, it would be like a handshake that meant something. If the servant meets him in and shakes his hand, the servant's saying, if I don't fulfill it, it's on, you know, your children can come after my family, it's on, you know, that, that this should be fulfilled. So what's he asking him to do? Verse 3, I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, by Adonai, by it. God of Israel, which whatever you want to say to realize who he's talking about, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. Okay, here's our whole scoop. Servant, my son needs a bride, but I don't want her from the women around here. I don't want her from the Canaanites who are our neighbors. They are not from the right line. Now, when we look at our history that we had, especially starting with chapter 10, we saw that the Canaanites, the Canaanites, that they're going to come from the line of Ham, Ham and his son Canaan, Canaan. That's how they get the name. Canaanite, Canaan, Canaanite, Canaan, however you, you pronounce it. That line was the curse line. Remember, Ham dishonored his father. And God said there would be a curse on that line. The line to the Messiah was not going to come through Ham. It was going to come through his son, Shem. Shem even means the name. And we know as we see and can look back, because we have that advantage, we can see the lineage, we can see the heritage, that it did go from Shem down to Messiah physically, you know, in that line. Why did this matter so much? This bride... This one who would be chosen, in particular, was going to be the mother of a multitude of nations. She was going to be the mother of the line that God promised his seed to come through. So if we had an unbalanced spiritual marriage, this would not be good. The Canaanite women were known for idolatry. They were known for worshiping other gods. Can you imagine Yitzhak trying to say, this is the will of God, this is the way we should live, and teach that to his son, and have Mama, who, look at how Sarah poured into Yitzhak, have Mama pour into Yitzhak's child something opposite, something that would take their eyes away from the one true and living God, the God of Israel, and turn them to idolatrous ways also. We see that in mixed marriages all the time, even to this day. And that's why we read in the Brit Shah that God says not to be unequally yoked, that you're not to put an unbeliever with a believer. It does not come out well the majority of the time. And this one in particular, because of the line and where it was leading, needed to be one who would have the same heart 
for the same God, the only God, the one true and living God, the God of Israel. Now, lest I said anything that hurts anyone today, I know there are many people in our audience here and other audiences everywhere that there is one member in in the church family and one member that isn't. And we're not telling you, believe that one. We're not telling you, bad. No, what we're saying is, is stay and live the, the, the example to them that hopefully will draw them to you. But if you're not in that relationship, don't choose that because God warned you there will be problems. Usually the, the Christian is the one who is pulled down. Again, exceptions everywhere, but please realize I'm not condemning anyone. And I am, you know, my heart's there for anyone in a, a situation. Uh, the Ecclesiastes said it best, how can two walk together if they're not agreed? You know, and it, it really, it's a heartache for the one who is trying to walk pleasing to the Lord and has to struggle with it because of their, their beloved partner. So um, Avraham doesn't want this for Yitzhak. I think because this line has to stay strong because remember we've got nothing but idolatry around this line and we don't have a multitude of believers at this point. We've got the line, the family line that's the believers and those who are coming into it. So Abraham was concerned. He wanted um, this to be what would be best for his son spiritually. Now politically it probably would have been the best thing in the world to marry a Canaanite. To have a, a um, oh, what do you call it, you know, like a peace treaty between, like you see often through history, you'll see, you know, one group living near another group, and uh, in the tribals especially, you'll see that, that they make a political marriage. This king gives his daughter to the son of, the, of their, you know, sometimes even their enemy. There's even a book out called Peace Child, and it was two tribes that the missionaries were there trying to explain who Yeshua was and the sacrifice that he was, and they were having a, a hard time communicating a language barrier for one thing, trying to learn the language of the people, and as they were living with them to learn the language, to be able to translate our scriptures into that language to help them understand, uh, they came to a time where, just a second, I'll get you, Dora, where the, the two tribes that had been at war, each mama of the head chief gave birth. One to, an, I think it was opposite sexes, but anyway, they both gave birth. And what the chieftains made them do is they gave their own baby to the other. So each mama still had a baby, but she was raising the baby of the other. Now, if you knew that someone had your child and you had theirs, You'd want to do everything you could to help this child have a wonderful life, hoping that mama would be doing the same thing. Look how I'm treating your baby and in return treat my baby that way. And through that, this missionary was finally able to explain the sacrifice of God who gave his son that, they, that loved them to that degree that there could be peace through that, peace through the son. If I didn't tell it well, look up the book and read it. It'll tell it better. Yes, Dora? Well, at the beginning, isn't that why uh, God asked, asked Abraham to leave his people? Yes, exactly. So he needs to follow through. If you didn't hear a question, Dora said, isn't that why God told Abraham in the beginning to leave his people? Yes, to leave idolatry, leave the false ways, follow me. And so, yes, it would be very important that his son follow also. That it wasn't just for Abraham, it was for the, the line. So when he, uh, the girl that was coming to the well, when she met all these requirements that were supposed to be, did that mean that she was a godly person? You've run ahead. <laughs> I will show you how it meant exactly that. But I'll show you how we know that. So, let's go on. We are, I think, all the way to verse 4. Uh, yes, we have read all three. Verse 4, but you will go to my country, to my relatives, and take a wife for my son Yitzhak. Okay, obviously there are those in Abraham's family now who must have come to believe. Abraham must have known that. There must have been, you know, some sort of communication through the travels, people who travel, whatever, because what Abraham is saying very clearly, don't just go back to my area, because remember, he left idolatry. 
but in his household, they had come to know about the one true and living God. Abraham could not have been called out by God if he didn't know God. And it must have been in the family also. In fact, that's probably better than how it was saying that they learned it through others who traveled. He probably knew when he left, the imprint of God, the God of Israel, was in their family line. So go back to my family. Look for a wife for my son in my family. Don't look for it in the idolaters around, but look for this one in my family. Okay, real specific. Not just get a wife from Mesopotamia, but get a wife from my relatives, from my family. So the servant said to Abraham, Abraham, suppose the woman is not willing to follow me to this land. Should I take your son back to the land from where you came? Hmm. The servant's thinking, is there going to really be a gal who wants to come sight unseen? And pledge her life to this one that she's never met and he's probably thinking that's a, that's a long shot you know I mean we talk about how hard it is for a girl to go on a blind date he's saying blind marriage blind life you know the, 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 and she, this is going to be it for her so he's thinking you know maybe I should take Isaac if there's one I find and let them meet Isaac yes Rhonda and you'll have to unmute yourself let me try to. I'm not leaving you. I'm just going off camera for a second. Okay. Okay. Rhonda, thank you. Poor Roger. Anytime he has to leave, he gets <laughs> caught. <laughs> and he doesn't leave without good reason. But it, it, it happens without fail. I tell him, you're not allowed to leave because we'll need you. <laughs> you unmute, unmute. I mute Rhonda so she can ask her question. Okay, try to unmute again, Rhonda. There we go. Okay. I thought uh, Abraham's father and his people were into all that idolatry. So what 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 are we who are we referring to? I think it's gotta be others in the family. You know, family was more than just the immediate in this case. Uh, but I think that he, Abram had to know, maybe among his brothers, because this is where it's going to go. So maybe he knew a brother had come to believe Maybe, I, I don't know how, but he did know that there would be one within his family that would be the right one. We're going to see his faith in God to do that. So God's putting it on his heart because he obviously is making it clear. I don't want one involved in idolatry. So maybe the fact... So was his mother, what, would, it, would it be more like they were looking to his mother's people and not his father's people? Could be. Could be. It's, it's going to end up coming through a brother, so um, it could be. It could, I, I really can't answer that specifically since Scripture doesn't tell us, but they, he had to have known there were those who the seed had been planted there also. Rowena, can you help? No, Try again. Yes. Yeah, but remember, uh, Sarai was also a relative. Yes, Abraham so married his sister. So whether he gets it from his mother's side or his father's side, they're all relatives. That's a good point. So, the, so her side of the family, yes, yes, and so. We're uh, saying that Abraham's wife, who's Sarai, right? Her people were not of the idolatry, and Sarah was his relative. Sarah, Sarah was his sister. His remember or half sister, you know. But as far as God was concerned, you know, was he was lying when he when he did disclose that she was his wife also, even though she was half-sister. So it was like a half-truth, we'd say. Um, so Sarah is definitely a believer. Also, when Abraham goes, we don't hear of her getting saved on the way. We don't hear of her fighting him. She had to be in agreement with him. So, yeah, you know, when he had to leave behind, he was supposed to even leave his father behind. It sounded like his father goes part way. You know, they... We don't know the influence that was being was having on them because I do. I'm trying to think why, but I do have in my mind that we think that Torah was a believer, also his father. Um, I really can't answer you other than the potential around him was there's no one, 
and the potential that there is someone is within his family, not within the area, but within his family. And that family, Abraham was one of three brothers that we know of. There could have been more, but we've got three names. And we are going to see that the one who comes comes from one of his brothers, but a little removed. And I'll explain that as soon as we get there. So, um, and, and could it be that because he was so wealthy and he had so many political connections in that land, that word went around that he was blessed? Remember even the non-believers in that area called him blessed of God? Right, right. And we do hear times when the testimony went before them, we've heard of you or something like that, mm -hmm. where we know that yes, there was a testimony. So they had ways that there was communication and maybe even seeing him so blessed he went out saying he's following god they saw his blessing wow i want to know that god too it could be it could be we, we can ask one day <laughs> good thought questions though it shows me you're thinking and that they're real people to you and i want that so um so we do have him going anyway he's going to send a servant take a wife from my relatives take my wife take for my son a wife from my relatives and the, the servants questioned then his concern let me see if I told you everything I wanted to tell you oh we don't know why Abraham was not going himself he probably felt too old even though Eliezer is old also or whoever the servant was is old also Abraham was even older remember he, he thinks his days are being numbered so he probably didn't fill up to the journey. There are those who say with his vast wealth and all, he had to stay there to stay in charge. But his servant really had that role of keeping the charge, uh, where you would think it'd be easier for Abraham to slip out for a time and come back than it would be for the head servant that's keeping everything going. But for whatever reason, Abraham felt and believed he was not the one to go, his servant was to go. And again, the father sends the servant for a bride. Look at Acts 15, 14. Let me give you that before we go on to our next thought. Acts 15 and verse 14, which ties into what I just said. And Acts 15, come on tablet. It went to John 15. There we go. Acts 15 and verse 14, we read, okay. Simeon or Shimon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his own name. Now the bride of Yeshua is the, the called assembly, the church, which is looked on as a Gentile bride. The majority of those in this family are Gentile. There are Jewish people mixed in. I'm what? So I'm not saying there are no Jews, but the majority is the Gentile. Remember, oh, Paul shows us this in the book of Acts when, when the rejection is against Yeshua. And finally, they, they, the, those who came to preach were told they couldn't. Then they were put in prison. Then they were beaten for preaching in, in the name Yeshua. And finally, Stephen is stoned. Four different times that we see that the gospel message was still being given as a whole, and I'm talking as a whole, to the Jewish nation. If at any time the nation of Israel would have accepted Messiah, then he would have returned at that time as their king and set up their kingdom. Can't have a kingdom if you reject your king, okay? Mm -hmm. But God knew they were not going to, and God knew that he had a plan, and Yeshua even said that he had sheep of another pasture that, that they knew nothing about. And we believe he was speaking about the Gentiles who would get come to salvation. That's going to be a great number of people. So when that final rejection by the whole nation, not every individual, we've got the Talmudim, we've got the 120 that, that the Holy Spirit fell on, we have 3,000 that were saved in a day, we've got it growing. But for the nation as a whole, they rejected. And when they made that final rejection, then God says, okay, I'm going to make you jealous then. I'm going to give to the Gentiles what you've had. They're going to be raised up as my priests, as my representatives. They're going to value the scriptures that you're not valuing, that you're not listening to. And they're going to make you realize you've missed something. You let go of something so that you'll want to come back in. And he makes it very, very clear. He is not replacing. 
he's bringing the nation to realize, hey, I want what I've been given. I want to be part of that. And that's why we keep, Paul uses, and this is Romans 9, 10, and 11 especially, but why he uses the analogy of the grafting in to the tree. And he warns the branches that are grafted in. That's the Gentiles coming into the Jewish Messiah. And he warns them, don't boast. Don't think you're so great because if God's willing to cut off branches that are, won't accept him and make room for you to come in, then he'll cut you off. If you're full of pride and, and you're not you know, one with me, the, the, the tree trunk, the root system, that's what all matters. You cut off the roots, you've got nothing. The roots are Yeshua, Jesus. So he's saying you boast in the Lord, not in you, not in your accepting. But he says the Gentiles are being grafted in. And we know that contrary to nature, with the olive tree, when a wild was grafted in to the original, it made the original come back to life. That's not the way it's supposed to go in in. What do I call it? Gardenology? What's the word I want? In um, husbandry? I can't think of the right word. But it is what happens, and you can study it. It's amazing, and it's a great picture because it gives absolutely no room for what's called replacement theology. God never said, I am done with the nation of Israel. I'm going to discard them or destroy them or throw them away. I'm going to give all their promises to the church. That's not what God does. He does provoke them to jealousy with the called out assembly with the church. But he gives other promises to the church. He gives other promises to those who are in the faith at this time. And he will restore Israel back to a place through her being provoked to jealousy. She'll finally cry out to her God. And just like Moshe was, was raised up to redeem them out of Egypt, Messiah will redeem them out of the tribulation of the world and set up his kingdom and fulfill the promises he made to Israel. He promised Israel an earthly kingdom. He promised Israel to reign on earth as head nation and the other nations to come up to, to Israel and be blessed. To the called out assembly, he has not promised us a spot on earth as an earth dweller in that kingdom. Where are we in that kingdom? We've come back from heaven where our citizenship is and we rule and reign with him in that kingdom. So we're not the earth dwellers, we are those over them ruling and reigning with the Lord as our head. We have a different promise than Israel has. And God fulfills every promise. And in the end, ultimately, when we get all the way past tribulation and millennium, and we get past the final, whatever, a Satan's attempt to, to, to throne God and set himself up as God, then we see that they both go on, Jew and Gentile, who are believers, go on into an eternity that we just barely have an outline just barely, just know a little bit. But nowhere does God ever make an end of Israel. He said he never would, and if he ever changes his mind and does that, then we as believers right now need to shake in our boots because we're told we're saved forever. If God can stop one, he can stop the other. But I will tell you, my God never lies, and he never comes back from his word. What he has promised, he fulfills. It may not be in the timing you think, it might not be on the day you think, well, it's got to be now, but it is in God's eternal program and his plan. And he has a wonderful plan that brings both Jew and Gentile into salvation and into a beautiful future, one being fulfilled in earthly ways and another being fulfilled in heavenly ways. So beautiful, beautiful program. And a beautiful picture here. The father is sending the servant to get a bride for the son. So here when, when he's talking to Simeon and he says that God's concerned himself about taking a Gentile people for his name, I want to encourage every Gentile who feels like second class. Where do you read it in there? Where does he say, well, the Jew is my first choice. I'll go with that second choice. <laughs> Nowhere do you read that. And on the contrary, I can even flip it and say Deuteronomy, Dabarim chapter 7 says when, that when God chose Israel to represent him to the world, he chose them because they were the 
runt. <laughs> they were the least and the least likely. So that who gets the glory? God. If you choose a Hercules to rescue somebody, everybody says, well, that's Hercules. But if you have this little 100-pound soaking wet, wimpy looking, who suddenly roars and does a magnanimous deed that rescues many, everybody's going to say, how do you do that? And if he points to his God, wow, what a testimony. So what an amazing God we have that shows us who he is in his love to every single one of his creation. For God so loved the world. Not for God so loved the Jew and finally decided to love the Gentile. No, 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 no. No. Throw that out. Okay? Back into Genesis. Chapter 24, and we are looking at verse 4 still. Okay, so he's to go to his country. Now, this is not a short journey, everybody. Remember, Abraham spent a lifetime being a nomad now, and he's traveled much. It's at least 450 to 500 miles away for him to go back to Mesopotamia. I'm going to show you on a map shortly uh, the area where they went. But that's the direct route. That's if you could fly like a bird. For the common route for the people to take that in that day, it was probably about a 900-mile journey. That's a long journey. It's going to take some time. But it's that important to Abraham that they're to go back to his kindred. They're to go back to get a bride that's going to be in the line of Shem. Nobody else is going to work in the line of Shem. Now, again, I've, I've talked to you about how the two needed to be united in their faith so that they would even be raising their children in the faith also so it wouldn't be mama teaching them idolatrous ways and daddy teaching them godly ways. No, they were both to be uh, united in their... Um, in their spiritual mindset, in their faith, in walking their faith. Uh, chapter 18 and verse 19 of Bereshit, of Genesis, it says, For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. So God was saying, I am keeping Abraham's house so that his children and his whole household will be what I want them to be. They will be the representative of me, of righteousness and of justice. And in the same way now, Abraham's saying that of Yitzhak, his family's got to be what will keep this pure and the, the truth being given out. So that's why back in 24, he's telling him, go, go to my family, go to the line of Shem, Take a wife for my son. Notice when the son gets a wife, by the way. It's after the death of Sarah. It's after the death of his mother. And we see that the son, the capital S-O-N, the son of God, receives his bride after the death and, of course, resurrection of him. It is after a time of death that we see the, the bride brought in. We can see again that the, fan, the father is planning a marriage for his beloved son, and it's in his perfect timing. And go with me to Matthew 22, and verse 22. Uh, sorry, verse 2. Matthew, Mattathiah, Matthew 22, verse 2. And we have here, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding feast for his son. And as it goes on, you will see that it's a picture of the father preparing the feast for the son, the marriage feast. So again, it's the father arranging the marriage for the son. And this also, by the way, was common. This was the custom in especially wealthy families that there would be an arrangement made for marriage and it would be through intermediaries. It wouldn't be necessarily the father going and doing it, but he would have a representative go. So Abraham is sending his representative. He is sending his uh, tried and true, his most faithful servant, the one he trusts with all of his household. He's telling him to go and, and the servant has asked, should I take your son? If, if there's a need, should I take your son? Verse 6, Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. 
And I've got an exclamation point in um, one of my versions here. I can hear Abraham being very emphatic, no, under no circumstances do you take my son. It could be said that Abraham was afraid his son would want to stay back there. Maybe wifey would want to stay with her family and he'd cave into the family. Whatever reason. But God had said they were to live in the land. They were to inherit the promises in the land. Abraham knew that meant that his son also needed to stay in the land. We call it at this point the land of Canaan, the land of Canaan. It will be what's later called the land of Israel. But uh, we read that Yitzhak never leaves the promised land. The closest we get to it is in chapter 26, verses 1 and 2, he's going to start going down to Egypt. He gets as far as Gerar, which is down south, but God warns him, do not go down into Egypt. At that point, Yitzhak was kind of following his father's example. Oh, we got famine in the land, we'll go down to Egypt, and that's where he got in trouble with giving Sarah to the, to the um, heathen king. You know, oh, she's my sister, not she's my wife. So Isaac, kind of following his father's footsteps, was ready to go down to Egypt when there was a need, but God stopped him short, and he, in obedience, stopped and never went further than Gerar. So to our knowledge, Yitzhak, Isaac, never left the promised land his entire life. So Abram makes it very clear, you cannot take my son. He's not to go, but he doesn't leave him hopeless and helpless. He makes it clear. Verse 7, the Lord, Adonai, the God of heaven, Jehovah, who took me from my father's house, from the land of my birth, who spoke to me and swore to me, saying to your descendants will I give this land. He will send his angel ahead of you, and you will take a wife for my son from there. So Abraham made it very clear. God made me a promise. He said, this land is for me. This land is for my progeny. That means it's for Yitzhak. Yitzhak needs to stay with where his inheritance is, and I have such faith in God that God is going to send his angel ahead of you and he will guide you. That was Abraham's faith and that was right on. He was so sure. I'm in the will of God. God's in the details. God's going to take care of it. So he's telling him, no worries. The angel of the Lord is going to go ahead of you and you will. He's saying you're going to succeed. You will take a wife for my son from there. Verse 8, but if the woman is not willing to follow you, he's letting the servant know, okay, I've heard you. If that happens, then you know what? You're free of this oath of mine, only don't take my son back there. So even though Abraham is so sure, he's just meeting the servant where he's at. He's just saying, I know you have this concern. I know the angel Lord is going to go ahead of you. I know you're going to pick a wife. I know you're going to bring her back. But if anything does go wrong, like you're afraid, just don't take my son. Instead, you're released from fulfilling this oath. So your family, my family's not going to come after you and your family because you didn't do right by me. I'll release you from the oath. And that was huge to be released from an oath. You, you just did not take an oath in those days expecting a release. It's you kept that word. But again, it wasn't a moment of weakness. I don't believe with Abraham. He was just trying to settle his servant down. If it went that way, then fine. I'll let you go. But I know the Lord's going to lead you. I am so sure. So, what happens? Verse 9. The servant hears all this and he places his hand under the thigh or by the side, however it should be, of his master Abraham and swore to him concerning this matter. He accepts the, the um, not the challenge, he accepts the, assignment. the what, I'm sorry? Assignment. Assignment, thank you. Both of you said it together and I missed it still. He accepted the assignment. Okay, I'm good, I get it, I'll go. So, verse 10, the servant took 10 camels from the camels of his master. That shows wealth right there, 10 camels to go with them. Now, they were taking provisions for a long trip. Remember, if we're told accurately, they're going to be traveling about 900 miles just to get there, 900 miles to get back, because even though the crow can do it in half of that, they can't. 
So they need a lot of food and of water. They're going through desert area. They're not going through McDonald's and In-N-Out and wherever else to stop on the way. And there isn't a spring to dive into. They're going to need to take. So they're taking provisions for the long trip. The camels could carry those provisions. Also, we because we've read ahead, we know that there are tokens that show Avraham's wealth that will be given to show because the servant's going to have to represent Avraham. If I were going to go represent you to people who didn't know you and say he's a man of wealth, your, your loved one will be kept well, will be fed well, will not starve, will, you know, I need to prove that to the family that this one has the means to take care of you. So they're going to take wealth along with them to be able to give to the family of the prospective bride. And there probably were a number of attendants in, uh, the, in the caravan, I'll call it, who would be along the way for protection also. Because if you're carrying provisions of wealth, there were marauders. You know, it's not that that started once we started with Pony Express and the mail would get robbed or the train would get stopped and the robbers would get on. This goes all the way back in time. So even as they would be traveling, they would need, need guards. They would need those who stayed awake at night to watch and make sure everything was safe. And of course, they got to have time to sleep, so you got to change guard, you know. So there was a whole entourage that is going, that we see by 10 camels going. They went out with a variety of goods. I already explained this good things of his masters in his hand. So he set out. He went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. That's exactly where Abraham came from. So he is going exactly where he is told. Now, when we, it says that he went to Mesopotamia, this is the type of the Holy Spirit who's being sent to earth. When did the Holy Spirit come to earth? What do we call it? Holy Spirit? No. Well, yes, it's the Holy Spirit coming. But on the day of Pentecost, Pentecost in your in your normal world, in my Jewish world, Shavuot. Okay, so we've got a type of the Holy Spirit being sent to earth after Yeshua raised from the dead, went up into heaven, and the Holy Spirit came to earth. And he is here even now calling out a bride for his son. Same picture of what the servant's doing going to call it a bride for his son. Mesopotamia is a word in the Hebrew. It actually could be translated Aram, A-R-A-M, M as in mother, Aram of the two rivers. That's probably either the Tigris uh, and the Euphrates, or it could be the Euphrates and a river called Shabar or Chabar in our Hebrew. Roger, if you can call up the map that I sent you just so that people can get a picture. Remember, it came from the area of Mesopotamia that we know has the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in it. If you get maps that are back in Bible times, you'll see a little river called um, Chabar. And if, in case if it is that one, I just want you to see it, but whether it was Tigris and Euphrates or Tigris and this little one, um, or Euphrates, I'm sorry, and this little one, they're very, very close. Okay. Up above, you see Tigris and Euphrates, right there. Those two stand out real well. Come, come down from the S and Euphrates, keep coming down. They spell it K-E-B-A-R, right there. That's still the Hebrew Chabar, the C-H or the K are interchangeable, Chabar River. Now, notice where Euphrates comes down. You see the word river for Euphrates. Right there, you see it branch off with the Kabar. Or Chabar. So the Chabar is a smaller river. It could be the area, Aram, of the two rivers because the whole area was Padan Aram, um, which I'll explain later when we get into that, the next chapter. But again, it'll be somewhere in this area. This is the area that um, Avraham came from. So it could be the Tigris and Euphrates, or it could be a little further down south, Euphrates and Chabar, because this is still two rivers and it's in the area of Aram. We get specifically that they went to Nahor. And we don't know exactly Nahor. We know the area. We know the vicinity. Um, it's the vicinity of what's called Haran. I didn't think to get you a map that showed it, but trust me, that area that you just looked at is Haran. In fact, if you go to the second map the second that map? I showed you, 
Yes, and be sure and share it. I don't know if I gave you time to share it last time. Anytime I don't, remind me because I want my Zoom audience to be able to see it too. The second one gives you just a little bigger picture to kind of get your feel for the area. Okay, and this one, the arrow's pointing to the area that they believe was where Nahor is. Um, the Chabar River down there. Go down further though, the one toward Babylon. Yeah, it's that one because we were down lower. Um, that's why with our Hebrew it's hard to know exactly, but the river could be an offshoot from higher or from lower. We're definitely in the right area. Being called Nahor tells us the vicinity of Haran. Now, Nahor was Abraham's brother's name, but Nahor was also Abraham's grandfather's name. So this area could have carried the name because they were a, a well-to-do, well-established family name that the people knew the area for their name. I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but it would be like when they first came and settled in our area, um, there was like large areas. We know that, that the Mormons came in and settled, but like Lugo is the name of one of our streets, and it was a Lugo um, family that had quite a plantation, quite a ranch area, that's how that street carried that name, the name of the Lugo family. It's that type of idea. So we're in the vicinity, we know for sure, and we know that he went to the area called Nahor, the city called Nahor, because he's going back to Avraham's family. Nahor being his brother, Nahor being the grandfather, if the grandfather's still alive. Um, where do I get the, the Nahor is the name for both? Genesis chapter 11. You can look it up on your own, read from verses 24 to 29 when we were there. We went through the heritage, the family line, and we saw that. Same way you have a junior today, it just skipped one generation in there. We've got a grandfather and we've got a brother. Did that even skip? Yeah, it did skip a generation. Okay. Um, it's interesting. Go ahead. So when was it that uh, Israel was established? I mean, because it never was until... Right, at this point, there's no Israel. Yeah. There's the land of Canaan, the land of Canaan. Mm -hmm. By the time you have Moshe raised up, well, you have, yeah, because even with Jacob, Jacob's where the name Israel comes from. So I'm going to say it starts with him because they became known as Israelites. They became known as, from, from Israel, from the land of Israel, named after when God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Uh, the, the parameters were drawn all the way back in Genesis, oh uh, goodness, 15, chapter 15. Gives the parameters that shows you the rivers that it takes in. It shows you that it goes up into Iraq and Iran and goes down into Egypt, takes in Syria and Lebanon. I mean, it's huge. The area that would be called Israel that God put his name on. They never got all that land because they weren't in obedience to God. They didn't walk the land and take the land that they were supposed to. They got a portion because that's what they did. But um, it's not called Israel until after Jacob's name is changed as we move on down the line. So, um, got a few years, few, well, Jacob's going to have been born to Isaac. I know this, and Isaac was older, and Jacob was older. I'll get you into the years, but we're, let's just say roughly 100 years later before you're looking at the name Israel in there. And the map's still being drawn, we'd say the land of Canaan, the land of Canaan, because the Canaanites were named after Canaan, who was the son of Ham, um, who moved into the area that God's going to thrust his descendants out along with the seven other, six other nations that are thrown out when he gives the land to the children of Israel. When you come through the wilderness, you come through, you know, the 40 years of wandering, and they're going to go into the promised land. That's when he promises to, to push out the seven nations that are in that land because they are so evil that he's going to take away even what they have and give it to the children of Israel and put his name on it and establish it as the land of Israel at that point. Because they didn't take the land from Egypt, because Egypt's down here, and so up here is... Mount Sinai, the Sinai Desert, 
part of the Sinai Peninsula is what should be part of Israel. Israel even had control of, of some of that and gave it back to Egypt to make peace with Egypt mm -hmm. that is tenuous to this day but is holding to this day. But so, yes, Israel was more northern than that, but it came down a little bit into, uh, down toward the Nile. And, uh, and then, like I say, up far up higher north and far more east. Of course, you can't go west because you're into the Mediterranean. <laughs> okay? Okay, good questions. Okay, so, and, and it is interesting, too, that archaeologists have found many, many references to the city of Nahor, um, where they've dug up um, the area. Um, there's another... I'll call it a city called Mari, M-A-R-I. Again, it's not on our maps that we can see, but you can get overlays. It'll show you it's in that area. It had a flourishing trade center from 2900 B.C. to about 1759 B.C. And um, the city that was built in the middle of the Euphrates trade routes was what was called Mari. And there's where they found in that area, so in this area that we're talking about, they found more than 25,000 tablets. And they mentioned Nahor, and they mentioned, you know, they back up what scripture says. You have to know how to read the ancient languages to know what they say. But it's amazing. You give archaeology enough time, I, I tell you it all the time it will prove the Bible to be true. I love the expression to turn a spade, meaning your shovel, turn a spade, and turn a page in the Bible. You'll see it come alive because it fascinates me. I love studying archaeology and watching my Bible come alive. Go to Israel, and even if you don't go on an archaeological dig, the archaeology you'll be introduced to on a tour showing you what it was like, when it was there, how it was, your Bible just comes alive. It, it's absolutely, there's nothing that comes against what the Bible tells us because the Bible is true. Every word is true. So, even though we're talking about a long road to travel and a, a time to get there, our servant made a beeline. He wasted no time. He took the, the camels, the things that his master sent out, went to straight to Mesopotamia, straight to the city of Nahor. I get a, a kick in my mind, I think, because of my childhood. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Don't go to jail. Go to Mesopotamia. But just go direct. He didn't take any scenic offshoots. Oh, I'll go check out what this looks like, and I'll visit with these people for a while. No, he said, I'm about my master's business, and I'm going straight. So he goes straight. He gets to Nahor. And he knows that he's where he's supposed to be. So verse 11, he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water when it was evening, the time when women would go out to draw water. So what happens is the wells, water was so precious, they didn't leave the well uncovered. They kept it covered. It would keep the water from evaporating as quickly. It would keep it from getting dirty also. And at a certain time, the big stone over the well would be moved and those coming in with their flocks, you know, from the field, they would be able to get the water that they needed. People from the town would get water that they needed, and then it would be covered up again. So he knows this is what, this is just life. He knows how life goes. He knows that he's coming in toward the evening, toward the time when the women are going to come to draw water from the well for their families, for, you know, the needs that are there. And so he's, he realizes where he is, and I love what he does. He goes to God in prayer. It's our first, um, I believe, yeah, yeah, it is our first recorded prayer in the Bible. And he makes it specific. If you want to learn how to pray, pray like this servant. The, um, verse 12, he said, Lord God, Adonai Yehovah, of my master Avraham, please grant me success today. Show kindness to my master Avraham. Remember, he's about his father's business. Behold, hello Lord, shalom Lord, <laughs> however you want to put it, I'm standing by the spring. The daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. He knows it's imminent. They're going to be there to draw water. Now, and I believe that the Lord put this thought in his mind, may it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your jar so that I may drink, and who answers, drink, and I will water your camels also. May she be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Yitzhak. You see, that servant heard Avraham. 
the angel Lord will go ahead of you. There's a divine appointment. He's got somebody. And the servant went out in faith believing also. There is one. So, Lord, when I ask to get a drink of water, because he'd need to as a visitor there and not having ability to help himself, the one who brings down her jar from her head, who would be filling that jar with water, getting it for her family, I'm, if I ask for a little bit, if I ask you for a glass out of your big jar, that's not so bad. But let the one who is the right one that you've appointed, let her say, drink, and I will water your camels also. May that be the one that's appointed, and by this all know you've shown kindness to my master. That is like a fleece. That'll be my guarantee. That woman is the right one. So there's going to be plenty of women who come. I don't know if he's thinking in his mind, I'll ask for a drink from the first one, I'll ask for a drink from the second, from the third, you know, till the right one says. I don't know what was in his mind, except he put out this plea. Now, why would it be a big deal for her to say she'd water his camels also? That's because this would not be an easy job. There are 10 camels. Those camels can drink 20 gallons of water. So you're talking 200 gallons of water that she's going to have to scoop up in her jar, pour out in a trough to feed, or to water, I'm sorry, these camels. You can imagine going to the well, getting her jar down, getting it filled and it'd be heavy, taking it, pouring it into the trough, which was probably close, but it's not going to be right on top of it. You're not going to want to be drawing your water out when the camels are right there, dirty and smelly and <laughs> drinking, but it would probably be close. But she'd be running back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and it's estimated that someone in good shape, it would take at least an hour of hard work to do this. So, if she's if she offers to do this, she's showing her character. She's showing what she's like. She's showing that she's strong and healthy. She's showing that she's industrious. She's showing that she's considerate and compassionate and gracious toward others. And Elias, or, or the servant, whoever he is, is thinking to himself, these would all be the qualities that she needs. Mm -hmm. She's going to be in charge of a lot of servants. She's going to be bearing and raising children. She needs to be compassionate and loving. She needs to be industrious. She needs to be in good shape. She needs to be healthy. She needs to be considerate of others. And I see her going above and beyond by being willing to take and, and nourish the camels also. So I think he came up with a good idea. I think God put it in his mind. And so he is pouring his heart out to the Lord. You know, I've made it, I'm here, I'm in the area. Now, how am I going to know the right woman? Let her say, I'll drink you and your camels too. Okay, was it the custom to send the women out to draw yes. the water? Yes. Because, I mean, they were wealthy, so they could have sent the it's, servants, right? Right, but it was the women's work. Yes. And you have women who were involved. You have Rachel, who's going to be on the scene after a little while, not yet, because that's going to be you know, the next generation down, who was a shepherdess, who was also at the well with water. So, yes, it was it was the custom. That was what the women did. Um, I'm sure it was hard work, but, but yes, it was part of the custom of the day. So, and that's why Eliezer, or the servant anyway, knowing, says, um, you know, the women are going to be coming out at evening. They come out in the cool of the day. They come out when the well has been uncovered because they can't go and get that in the middle of the day on their own. They wouldn't be able to move the stone for one thing and for another thing with the high heat. It's not the time to go draw water out. Water is precious. We're going to draw it out in the evening when, again, just to make every drop last longer. But the women were, that was their, their job, one of their jobs. You know, women worked very hard, um, which, again, still, yeah, it, probably any of the women had the ability, but how many of them would think, you know, yeah, I'll stop for a second, I'll take care of your knee because you asked me, but I want to hurry and take care of all my chores and all my deeds and all of my family and whatever all I have to be doing. So, again, it's going to show one who's willing to give of herself, and that's what he's looking for. He wants someone very, very special for his master, Avraham. And what happens? Verse 15, don't miss this. And it came about before he had finished speaking. 
he didn't even get the amen on his prayer. He's in the middle of his prayer. It, God says in, in Yeshua, Isaiah 65, verse 24, before they call, I will answer. Before the servant even started crying out to the Lord for this next phase, the Lord had already sent the answer on the way. The one who's coming is going to be Rivka, Rebecca, and before the servant can even say amen, here she is, behold, Rebecca, Rivka, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcha, the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor. Ding, 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 ding. We're in the family. <laughs> she came out with a jar on her shoulder, the typical way. That's why you see when they draw, you know, pictures, or sometimes you can even, and I don't have it here. I, 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 give me one second. I'm going off camera. I think I have something my folks brought back from Israel in 1954. <laughs> <laughs> okay, forgive me, it hasn't been used for a while, and it doesn't show it exactly, but what this is supposed to be a picture of, and I'll let Roger get a close-up, and uh, I should take my flower out, because this is the well, <laughs> and her jar is down off her shoulder already, but it's supposed to be Rebecca at the well, with her jug to get water, to draw it out of the well to go water, there we go, Roger's got a close-up there. And have you shared it, Roger? Because if not, I'll hold it here. Oh, it's on. It's running camera. It's, oh, okay. Okay, so they do see it. Okay, good. Yeah, that's right, because it's not all the email. Anyway, if I had thought I would have had it here earlier, but I'll set it down. If you want to see it again later, let me know. But that came back uh, as a symbol to represent Rebecca, Rivka, at the well. Uh, so before the servants even finished, he, this one comes. Now, we're getting the whole story. Born to Bethuel. Bethuel. Uh, that's Abraham's nephew. It's Rebecca's father. Okay, I'll say it in English so you don't get get confused. That makes her Abraham's great niece. Okay, Abraham's nephew is the father of Rebecca. So Bethuel and Isaac are first cousins. Abraham has Isaac. Nahor has Bethuel. Okay, I think that's easy to see. You've got Abraham and Nahor in this generation. One generation down you have Bethuel. And, well, here you've got Isaac and here you've got Bethuel. Now, Bethuel has had Rebecca. So, Rebecca, looking up here to where Abraham is, is, <coughs> is a great niece. And that would also make her first cousin once removed. First cousins were her dad and Isaac. She's once removed. She's one step down. So she's a first cousin once removed to Isaac. Okay? A little confusing, <coughs> easier on paper. Abraham and, and Nahor are brothers. Isaac and Bethuel are the cousins from the brothers. Isaac is going to marry, because I'm telling you ahead, <laughs> I'm spilling the beans. He's going to marry Rebecca, his cousin's daughter. So first cousin, once removed, okay? And then we come on down to Jacob and Rachel, but I won't confuse you. We'll get there with second cousins when we get there, okay? Now, she's the right family. She was born to Benuel, the son of Milcha, the wife of Nahor. Nahor is Abraham's brother. I think I've made it clear for you. Verse 16, the young woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had had relations with her. He spells it out. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up. So she went down to the well, got her water, and came up. Now, she's very beautiful. She's fair. Hebrew says she was exceedingly fair. He wanted the best for his master. He wasn't just concerned about the internal. He was also concerned about the external. So he sees a young woman, a damsel, that he thinks, ooh, she's beautiful, and she's a virgin. Now, before I tell you how she knew, how he knew that, look with me at 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. Because remember, we're looking at type here. Oh, come on back. Come on back. Thank you. 
Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. We already know that the servant's a picture of the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, it is Paul speaking. He's speaking as the spiritual father to the Corinthians that are in the Corinthian assembly. The, the called out assembly, the ecclesia, the church. Okay? And he says, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband. Betrothal is as good as marriage. That's engagement to one husband so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. What shall Paul is saying to the Corinthian church that we as a whole church, the called out assembly, whether you're from Corinth or whether you're from San Bernardino, in this called out assembly, what Paul was saying is, I'm presenting you as a pure virgin. You're not idolatrous in your ways. You are spiritually pure coming to the Father because you showed Jesus to make you pure. And he's telling him, live a life in the flesh that resembles your life in the spirit. Don't be a, 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 a don't be playing where you shouldn't play. How do I put this nicely? How do I keep this PG? <laughs> you should you should not be out about with others. You stay true. You know you stay pure. We see that in the spiritual realm also. We should not have an affair with anything idolatrous. I'll put it that way. We should stay pure and true. So again, the Holy Spirit's calling out a pure virgin because when you come into salvation you're putting on the, the lord's robe of righteousness you can be presented to to the father to the son i'm sorry being his bride as pure spiritually speaking regardless of what you did in your life your sins are washed away but you need to live your life in a way that resembles your spiritual status so she is a virgin she's pure she's not a picture of idolatry and probably the way he knew this was her apparel the the clothing that she would wear some say it was the color and some say it was the way it was worn the virgins wore differently than the married women so that no one got confused Rhonda you have a question is that the same virgin word that they use for Mary and Isaiah it is. You have opened up a very good question. I won't get sidetracked right now and tell you the whole Hebrew. I'll just give you a bottom line, but sometime if you want to study on that, there are two Hebrew words that are translated. One speaks of a virgin only, and one speaks of a, a woman in her purity. Not necessarily a virgin, because a married woman is not impure. She's having relations within her marriage that's she's still pure there's controversy over what word is used in the hebrew but when you keep it in the context of the verse the verse that we're referring to says that the virgin shall conceive isaiah 7 14. we know that it's a messianic it's saying that the virgin is going to be found with child and his name is going to be emmanuel god with us now Oh, I skipped an important part in Isaiah 7, 14. I'm trying to shorten it. It says, this will be a sign to you. A virgin will conceive. Okay, now, if it just meant a young woman in her purity, what kind of a sign is it for a young woman to get pregnant? That happens all the time. Many of you I'm looking at were young women who got pregnant. <laughs> okay? Every birth is a gift from God. I'm not denying that, but that's not a sign. But if a virgin who is not with a man, who does not have sexual relationships with a man, is found with child, that's a sign. That's something miraculous. A sign, we know all the way from Genesis, signs are miracles, are miraculous happenings that God is causing to happen for his purposes. So the Hebrew word that is used gives that miraculous sign. So the word translated for virgin should be the word of the, the pure um, female. It should have no chance of being looked at as 
a good woman in right standing with her husband or anything like that. It should stand just for that virgin because that's the only way it's a sign. Um, and when I go into the Hebrew, have it in front of me and tell you the Hebrew words, I can show you it and I can give it to you even more specific, but let that be in a nutshell for you. So yes, when God said it'll be a sign, she'll be a virgin. And remember, that's, that's um, going to be the miraculous birth of the Messiah. Now we're talking about the Messiah receiving a virgin bride, a bride that is coming to him in purity because she's been washed in his shed blood and placed his robe placed on him, which notice also here, her apparel. We're going to talk more about her apparel at the end. I have a feeling we're not going to make it through the whole chapter. <laughs> I always think I can do more than I do. Sorry, folks. I, I'm either the biggest fool or the eternal optimist. Take your choice. <laughs> but we're here to learn. We're not here to conquer 67 verses in one time. But when we get to the end, we're going to see that her apparel again um, it talks to us about his robe of righteousness. I'll just tell you that since we may not got, get there today. But uh, the, the servant could easily see that she was a virgin. So everything's going off in his mind. Oh, she's pretty. She's a virgin. We're going to find out that the, the fact that it's the right family. But uh, there's still a big requirement. Remember what he prayed? She's got to do something. She's got to offer to water his camels. So let's go back to Genesis and see what happens. Does our gal ruin the picture or does she rise to that occasion? What kind of person is she? What's her character like? Continue so, next week. <laughs> not quite. Roger's saying continue next week. Yeah, we'll give you the flashbacks. <laughs> Film at 11. <laughs> okay, so. And I had lost my place. I'm finding it real quickly. Okay, there's his prayer. Um, okay, I, would, I didn't go down far enough. Okay, we are in verse 16, that she was beautiful. Um, she came down the spring field of jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her. So see, there's a little difference. And he has those over there. Oh, I like what I'm seeing. He runs over there to meet her. Please, let me drink a little water from your jar. I'm thirsty. Obviously, he's been traveling. That would be no surprise to be asked that. And here's her answer, verse 18. And she said, drink, my lord. That's just an expression of politeness. Um, drink, mister, you know, said today, something like that. Drink, my lord. Then she quickly lowered her jar to, to her hand and gave him a drink. She poured it out. They probably had something there that, you know, could be used as a drinking utensil. Now, when, he had fin when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, here we go. I will draw water for your camels until they have finished drinking. Can you imagine how the servant's heart had him <laughs> left? She said it. She did it. Exactly what I asked. I mean, he must have been ecstatic because she's meeting every requirement. But he doesn't know that yet. See, we get the whole story. We get the details. He doesn't know who she is. All he knows is she's from the city, the right area. That's all he knows, though. And she's showing the qualities, and she's beautiful, and she's a virgin, but he doesn't know everything yet. So verse 21, he's observing her. So, uh, verse 20, we've got to do that first. She quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw, and she drew for all his camels. So she's done this trip back and forth, back and forth, However much her jar could hold, she's done 200 gallons of water. Now, the way I picture this in my mind is if I pick up a gallon of milk, that's heavy. And if I get it and I pour it out, I didn't even have to fill it up. But I just get it and pour it out, and I'm going to do that all of these times. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of work. That's diligence. That's care, compassion, everything he had said. So while she's doing that, meanwhile, the man was, and that means the servant, was taking a close look at her in silence. He's just standing back and he's just watching her. He's observing her to find out whether the Lord had made his journey successful or not. He had to have been thinking, wow, is it this easy? Boom, I got it right out of the gate. The first one I see, the first one I ask, fulfills what, what my pledge or my plea before the Lord was. Could this really be? Well, there's only one more thing he's got to know to know whether it's right or not. And 
he, he's taking a step. He's taking a step in faith. Verse 22, when the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her wrists weighing ten shekels in gold. Okay? He took out what most girls like, jewelry. Oh, those are pretty baubles, you know. And they're gold, you know, this is showing a little bit of wealth here. And he said, whose daughter are you? See, remember, he's not just supposed to get someone from Nahor, or someone from Mesopotamia, I should say, but he's got to get someone from Avraham's family. So here's the million-dollar question. Whose daughter are you? Please tell me. Is there room for us to stay, stay overnight at your father's house? He's just stepping out on faith the whole way. I have a feeling you're the right one. I need it confirmed, but is there any chance that we can stay where you are? Get to know, get the answers that we need. Now, he's already given her gifts. Those are preliminary gifts of a taste of what's to come. Just a little, here, let me give you a little token to say thank you for the work you just did. But it's a nice little token. It's not just a cheap little thing. It's a nice little token. Token, And he's basically saying, now, will you extend hospitality to me? Can we stay the night? Do you have room at your place? This was typical in the culture. Can we, in Hebrew, pass the night with you? Can we come? Okay, so he, he's on, he's wondering, he's hopeful, and he's excited, and she says to him, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, Milcha's son, whom she bore to Nahor. Like I said, ding, 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 all the green lights, everything goes off. Everything he needed, she has just told him. She's Abraham's kindred. That was what was required in verse 4. Nahor is Abraham's brother. He is talking to Abraham's grandniece. Here she is, everything here, and now let's go forward with that eastern way of hospitality, which shows that her family also was well-to-do. If they could put them up for the night, then they weren't just scraping by and poor people. They were also, they had a bit of wealth in their family. And what does she say to him? She tells him who she is. She doesn't know that she's just answered his prayer request. She's just telling him facts, you know, I'm, this is my mom, this is my dad. And again, she said to him, verse 25, we have plenty of both straw and feed and room to stay overnight. We'll take care of your camels, we'll take care of you. Again, she's showing, she's extending everything. We've got enough and we've got enough to share and she's got the kind of heart to be compassionate and share. So, wow, he is so overwhelmed that verse 26 then the man bowed low, worshipped the Lord. He knew he had everything that he needed. And remember, he was a little concerned initially, what if, you know, she doesn't want to come back, and Abraham's told him, basically, go in faith, and here she is, everything's coming together. He's amazed. He falls down on his face, basically. He's thanking her. He's bowing in respect to her and thanking her for this kindness that she's going to show because, again, that meets the requirements. And all I can think of in, in our scriptures for us is Ephesians 3.20, that the Lord is able to do abundantly above all that we ask or think. This, this is our kind of God. Verse 27, he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and his trustworthiness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brothers. So now he's spilled those beans. He's come and he's landed. And guess what? I'm a relative or I'm representing. He's not, but he's representing the household that he is a relative. Uh, uh, or, you know, yeah, Abraham's their relative. You guys got it. <laughs> okay. The Lord God has guided or the Lord God has led me. The servant did his part. God was faithful to lead him all the way. Tehillim, Psalm 37, verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He doesn't let him down. Proverbs 3, verse 6, 5 tells us, commit your way into the Lord, trust in him. He will, verse 6, direct your path. Eliezer, or the servant, that's all he could do. Put his faith in the Lord, trust the Lord, and because he was looking to the Lord to lead him, we see the Lord led him right straight 
pin the tail on the donkey. <laughs> he didn't miss. He hit gold coming out right away. So she now knows they're going to have company. they got to do something about it. So the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. Okay? Hey, Mom, I went to get water at the well, and guess what? I met this servant, and I watered his camels, and he's asked to stay overnight with us, and look what he's given me. Look at the tokens of appreciation that, that have been given to me. Now, she ran to tell her mother first. Bethuel, probably her father, probably had, besides his wife, concubines. Because this was typical in what was done. We see it, you know, even with Abraham taking in Hagar, wasn't supposed to, but Hagar would have been like a concubine. Is, is they don't get all the, the status of a wife, but they get some privileges because they're having children for that person. So Bethuel probably also had more than Milcah. Milcah was the, the mother of Rebekah. But if this is the case, and we see it with the tribes, we see it with the four mamas and the 12 sons that make up the tribes of Israel later, and I'm sure with, with Jacob, Leah, and Rachel must have had their own tents. You can't really expect the women to get along in the same small area when they are, you know, their own person. So probably Milcah had her own tent, her own place, and she would have been the esteemed one because she was the, the actual wife, not just a concubine. She probably had this tent large enough that her children lived in the tent with her. If he had other children from the others, they would live in the other tents, not side by side in one, so it's really so as to keep peace. So she probably, hearing the servant's prayer that he's a relative, has run to tell them that, look, we got company coming. He's going to come to our tent. He's part of our kindred. He's part of our family. Ima, I've met someone who is representing Abraham, my great uncle. Okay? She's got it. She's catching on to that. Well, the, the woman's running the mountains into the mother's household and told these things have happened. Now, Rebecca, verse 29, had a brother whose name was Levon, or Laban, as you say. Laban ran outside to meet the man at the spring, okay? Boom! He's out of the house in a heartbeat. What does this tell us about him? He probably was the, the senior male um, the active in the house. He probably kind of had charge of the household. The oldest son often would be the one that would run in that role. As the parents age, she'd be taking over. Even what we'll see in the birthright is the oldest would have the uh, responsibilities of the household. And um, Nahor, we know, had a concubine, by the way. Um, Nahor being the, the, I lost it, Abraham's brother. Genesis 22, 24 tells us Nahor had a concubine. So probably Bethuel also did. So Laban is going to be watching out for Milcah and watching out for Rebecca because that's his area of responsibility. He's going to make sure they don't get cheated out of what they should have and what should be theirs. But the fact that he ran out the way he did, um, oh, and by the way, other views are that Bethuel could have been too old. He could have been an invalid, and that's why he wasn't taking that role. But most likely it just is that Levon Laban was moving up to be that spokesperson who would be the head of the household. And we see that because we see the way he treats Jacob later. He's the one that's calling the shot. So it fits, you know, that more likely he was firstborn and having the responsibilities for his mother, his sister, any unmarried um, sisters as he, you know, grew into that position. Yes, Roger? When I was reading it, I kind of thought that he was, in his mind, he was kind of like greedy. You know, she's coming in with all this gold and stuff like that. And you're ahead of me. You're right there. Yeah. And you're right on target. Yeah. He took one look at those baubles and it's like, whoo-wee. This is wealthier. If he's willing to give that just because you did what you did, mm -hmm. mm, I want to meet this one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yes, when he saw, and that's the key. That's how we get that idea um, in uh, verse 30. When he saw the ring, 
and the bracelets on his sister's wrists. When he heard the words of his sister Rivka, Rebecca say, This is what the man said to me. He went to the man, and behold, oh, okay, this is what the man said to me. He went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. So Levant shoots out of the tent like a, a bullet. <laughs> yeah, bullet out of the, the gun or the ball of cannon out of the, you know, the cannon's gone off, whatever, however I should say it. I'm running out of words because I'm watching the clock and trying to get to a stopping point. He saw expensive gifts. He decided this is somebody worthwhile, somebody worth my attention, somebody worth my time. And even knowing that it's of his family, they very likely knew of Abraham's wealth, like we talked about earlier, that they knew that uh, from travelers and on that it was well with Abraham. So, okay. You know, we're interested. You, you'll see it so often in the workplace. People want to wine and dine the one who's got money, who can bring money into their their um, office in, in some way. They're not going to take that kind of time. They're not going to be that kind to a stranger that is looking for a handout or doesn't have anything really to offer in exchange. So Levant's he's about business, he's about wealth, he's got an interest. Whoa, uh, yeah, let's see what we can get out of this deal, probably. Not knowing what the deal is going to be, but why is he here? What's going on? If he's giving gifts, let's see what he'll gift me with. You know, he, he's, he's not a good character. And we know that as we go on and, and learn more about him later. But... Um, verse 31, I'm really trying to find a place to stop. He said, come in, blessed of the Lord. So he, he's got a key right there, blessed of Jehovah. Probably he was saying that because Rivka probably mentioned what the servant had prayed. And remember, the servant prayed, it was back up in verse 27, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and trustworthiness toward my master. Okay, so Rivka's probably said that, Levon's heard that, he's raised out, this one's blessed. So, hmm, you know, he, we know the Lord's blessed him, the Lord's blessed our, our relative Abraham, we've heard that. Let, let's see what we're finding out, Let, what is going on. So, and I know where I'm going to stop, it's coming right up, okay. Um, come in, blessed of the Lord. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. This is what the man said to me. He went to the man, he went to the servant, who's still standing by his camels at the spring. Probably Rivka said, let me go tell my family, we'll take care of you. And she might have even said, wait here. You know, it would just be typical. If I've got a whole lot of people coming in to my mama and my brother, I'm going to want to give them a head start. Hey, we got company coming, you know, get the house ready, do what you can real quick, they're right here. So that was just, you know, typical the way it would be, and he's waiting politely until he is escorted into the house. So Levon, you know, is saying to him, why do you stand outside since I've prepared the house and a place for your camels? You know, I'm sure Rivka said, I told him we could take care of his camels, feed his camels, as well as take care of him. So being extended his invitation from Levon in verse 31, verse 32, the man, the servant, entered the house. Then Levon unloaded the camels, and he gave straw and feed to the camels, water to wash his feet, and the feet of the men who were with him. Okay, so they're being escorted in, they're coming in, they're doing the polite things that are being done, and Levon is being very careful to treat them courteously. He's, he's, he doesn't want them, you know, to feel offended or anything. They're about to offer them a meal. That's very customary also. And even when business was going to be done, and it's still true to this day in Eastern culture, they'll have a meal, then they'll discuss business. Now, I'm going to stop it here, but I'm going to tell you it doesn't go in that order. The servant doesn't have the meal first, okay? So I'm going to put it on hold. You've got the servant coming in. You've got him being treated well. You've got Levon being very interested. And why are you here? What else do you have? Maybe he even thought, if I take care of your camels, what token are you going to give me to thank me if you were so generous with my sister? So he's looking out, but the servant has single-mindedness. He's got his plan, his agenda, and nothing's going to detour him. So we will pick it up. We are halfway through our story. It's not that we crept too slowly. But uh, we'll come back next week and find out if it goes well for the servant 
Is he going to be released from his oath to Abraham and not bring a bride back? Or is he going to have gotten it all and he's going to be bringing a bride back also? And we're going to continue to build on that picture of the bride coming to the bridegroom. That kind of begins to tell you how the story goes, but I think most of you right ahead know it anyway. <laughs> But, uh, but there's a whole lot of symbolism, especially as we wrap up this chapter that will come out of this picture of the bridegroom, the bride, the unnamed servant, the Father in heaven. It gets better and better. So come back next week for part two. We'll pick up with um, right there with the food being offered, the man entering the house, uh, verse 33. We'll pick up at 24:33 when food was set before him to eat. He said, I will not eat, and I'm going to stop you midstream. You have to come back to find out why he won't eat, okay? Was it not kosher? Was that his problem? Aren't they relatives? What's going on? Why is he saying, whoa, wait a minute, come back next week? And even if you know, come back next week. Because yeah. <laughs> hopefully as we go through it, you'll learn some things you don't know because every time I go to scriptures I've gone through, the Lord still shows me new things. It's always exciting, always living. Any comments, questions? Very good. I hope it's alive to you. I hope you're watching the scene unfold. I hope you're picturing it, even though my little Rebecca is stoned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I do have a precious Rebecca in my heart. <laughs> For those who don't know, my niece slash daughter. But uh, I just don't want this one to be real to you also. She is quite a character. Um, and I mean that in a good sense. You know, our, we've already begun to see that we're going to see more. So. Again, any more questions, comments? I'm looking at smiles, but I'm not hearing voices. Yes, Rowena. And everybody can unmute. Um, I, I'm just enjoying how the narration is going on. And like the Holy Spirit is preparing the audience, which is us, about the character of this Laban, because he's going to be in the next um, chapters also. Right, right. The foreshadowing on so many levels. But, uh, but what he shows us of who he is representing is even greater of a picture. But I agree. I agree. The Lord's in every detail. You know, we get little tidbits, little droplets. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, Lita. Uh-oh. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Yes, um, I believe that the prayers of a righteous man are made much. Good, yeah. good verse to include, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. His, the prayer of that man was answered right away. Amen, amen, and we would all love answers before we put that amen on it. We would love it, and the Lord does say he, he answers before we call. But that doesn't always mean that we see the answer before we get the amen on it. It's just God always does answer. He's, he's faithful. But yeah, I, I just can imagine how ecstatic he was as this is unfolding. I, can I really believe this? You know, did, I found the right one, the right person right away. You know, he didn't have to go through, you know, let, let's, that old, this will tell you my age, that old dating game. You know, let me interview um, Bachelor at one, two, oh. and three. And, and choose, you know, the one I think I'm going to be most compatible with. He didn't have to guess, which one are you leading me to, Lord? Who should I take home? No, he, boom. Yeah, you know, and I believe God put in his heart what to pray. I believe God does that with us. You know, we, we, the Lord, I don't mean this personal, but it is. I am so thrilled, and I want your prayers. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk for two more minutes, sorry, but. We are at the very last, last, last of the stages of getting my dad's testimony tracked into Hebrew so that we can give it out in Israel and with Hebrew-speaking Israelis that we meet around here, you know, many different ways. I know God put that on my heart. I don't know why God didn't put it on my dad and mom's heart, but for whatever reason, he put it on my heart. I've prayed for this for years. I've seen it start and sit. Start and sit. All of a sudden, in the last uh, in several months it's taken, it started clicking and it started coming together. Someone came alongside me who had contact with others who speak Hebrew. That's where I lack. And so through her, 
I give credit where credit is due. She met an Israeli. Um, we're being recorded. His initial is D. <laughs> He's not yet a believer. Notice my emphasis. <laughs> He's not yet a believer. But he agreed. At first he didn't want to uh, help because he didn't have time. But then he agreed to go ahead and help. And in the meantime, my, my friend found someone else who also has Israeli contacts and has abilities. And they were helping also, but they're extremely busy and they, everything wasn't coming together there. So my friend kept going back to D to get D's help. Then as the translation progressed, it came from the back east source also. And um, my friend asked D to proof it. And he said, uh-uh, he said, they've missed some things here. Now, knowing he's unsaved, is he really grasping what's going on? Well, as she worked with him, and as we've been praying, it was very quickly made clear to us by his own words, who said, I may not believe with everything that's being said, but it needs to be said accurately. It needs to be translated correctly. They missed here, and, he, and my friend knows more Hebrew than I do, so he showed her how they missed there. And the testimony tract is called from a hopeless end to an endless hope, which is a play on words. And D said, I get that title. I love a play on words. And he said, they're not getting it in the Hebrew. The title has been submitted to you shouldn't be that. It should be this. So he's really come along to help us fine tune and accurately put it out. And one area leading up to just about where my dad gets saved, a line had accidentally been skipped. And it changed the meaning not having that line in there. So D has really done us such a wonderful blessing of making sure it really is accurate. But what I keep chuckling about is, as I said, D doesn't believe. And at first he doesn't want to do it. You know, I'm too busy. Oh, okay. I'll help. You know, then we have to keep coming back to him. Every time we have to go back to him to proof an area again, he's having to reread it again. He's having to hear it again. He's having to think again. He's having to want to make it accurate, even if I don't agree with what's being said. Well, my dad was so stubborn. He's been... 12 and a half years fighting what he was being told, 10 years into it, tells Claude, who's witnessing to him, I want nothing to do to it. I don't want to ever hear it again. Don't speak to me again. I was born a Jew. I'll die a Jew. And Claude's response was, good, die a saved Jew. You know? He didn't let up. And I just keep praying, Lord, is this the time? Because the first fruits of this tract being in Hebrew is going to be deep, that he's going to get saved by the time we get it translated, or shortly thereafter, God's timing, not mine. But do you know how my heart would soar if Dee walked up to my dad in heaven one day and said, I'm here because God used your testimony and my ability to translate to reach me. <laughs> Could that be a servant thing here? <laughs> I'd love to believe it. Let's close in prayer. Let's pray for D and anyone else because I fully believe God's timing for that track to be in Hebrew is now. His timing, not mine. Lord God, thank you. You are amazing and awesome, and you are in the details. You are you dot every I, you cross every T. Every prophecy is perfectly and completely fulfilled in a way that blows our minds, Lord. Thousands of years, hundreds of years ahead, and you fulfilled exactly. Lord, open the eyes of our Jewish fellow brethren to hear and to know these truths about their very own God, their very own Messiah, the Son of God, the living God, the one true God of Israel. And let it be with thee, especially as he helps us finish this translation. Lord, reward him with salvation. How beautiful it would be. Not that we earn salvation, I don't mean it in that way, but how beautiful it would be if he would be first fruits, first Israeli saved from reading and translating that testimony into Hebrew. I fully believe you put it on my heart, and I believe that this is your timing. Let this be an experience as with the servant care. Let it be that every detail comes together, and Lord, we do pray for his salvation in the end. And again, may it be first fruits that many more Hebrew readers will come to saving knowledge of you as Messiah because of it. Bless Everyone here now as they go, Lord, just encourage them in their hearts. You're working in every detail. You're dotting every I. You're crossing every T. 
Your timing is perfect. You are seldom early, never late, and always on time. May we yield to it. May we walk it in and allow you to lead every step of the way. And Lord, thank you that the fervent prayer of a righteous soul, and we are righteous in you, avails much. Hallelujah. Praise your holy name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Uh, well, I hope you feel as fully satiated spiritually as I do at the moment. <laughs> I've had a